presented this, uh, will be presented by Shreya. Uh, the title is Don't Let the Storm Get Inside. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I've uh, titled my presentation as Don't Let the Storm Get Inside You. I'm presenting on behalf of Medicine 3. So um, coming to the history of the patient, uh, this is a 42-year-old female who had presented to our OPD with history of left leg pain for the past 20 days, right-sided flank pain for the past two days, history of high-grade intermittent uh, fever for the past two days, with no history of any dysuria, uh, with uh, no history of um, immobilization or uh, um, prior histories of any leg swelling in the past. So um, she uh, is, has no known comorbidities, but uh, the past history is only significant for a trauma in the past, which was post an RTA. She had a head injury uh, during which time she was admitted with us and she was discharged following that she never had any deficits. So on examination, her vital signs showed Want to give us a little bit more detail about the leg pain? Uh, so sir, uh, it started uh, 20 days ago. That was it was a sudden and onset type of a left leg pain, and uh, she didn't have any uh, fever associated with that at point and of the time. Nature of the character of the pain, so it radiation was a constant associated pain. symptoms. It was a constant pain, non radiating, not involving the whole of the left leg. Uh, actually, it was only involving the props, a uh, distal part of the left lower <laughs> limb, only the um, only near the ankle and uh, about half above the ankle. That's about it. It wasn't involving the calf. Go ahead. So on examination, her uh, vital signs had a she had a pulse rate of one hundred and two per minute. It was uh, regular uh, and uh, normal in character volume, and all peripheral pulses were well felt. Uh, her blood pressure on the right upper limb was one hundred and ten by seventy mmHg with a respiratory rate of twenty two per minute. General examination showed a goiter that was present with a left leg warmth and tenderness that was present. Uh, but uh, there was no calf tenderness. It was only uh, along the side of the um, distal part of the leg. There was some tenderness on and tenderness and warmth around that area. That's all. Uh, on abdominal examination, she had a right renal angle tenderness that was present. But she didn't have any liver or spleen that was palpable. Uh, PR examination was normal. Other systems did not reveal any significant clinical findings. So at this point of time, uh, this is a lady who has come in with uh, uh, history of fever along with right renal angle, right flank pain, along with a history of, with a recent history of a left leg pain. So what uh, differentials would you, what, what will be your anatomical localization? It doesn't. The slido is not working actually. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's not downloaded on the PowerPoint. It's not downloaded on the computer. So, uh, I'll go to uh, presentation of the differential. So, she actually came with fever with right renal angle tenderness with a recent history of her left uh, leg pain as well. So anatomically, uh, what we can localize a fever and the right renal angle tenderness is to the kidney. But she had no dysuria, no, no lower urinary symptoms. No urinary tract symptoms at all. That makes the diagnosis of urinary tract infection very unlikely, unlikely. no? Yes, sir. So, but we Did she come in because of the leg pain or the fever or both? So she had this right renal angle tenderness which had been there for around two days and she had come and that was a constant pain. That was troubling her. That is the reason why she had come to the hospital. 
So if at all the localization is musculoskeletal, no? That's uh, what we And the thought. soft tissue, meaning she had warm, tenderness, redness along the medial aspect of the... Medial uh, and the, it's along the distal aspect. So uh, we thought of whether or not it could be related to an infection like a pyelonephritis, but she did not have any dysuria. Other things that we thought of was a psoas abscess, which could uh, explain the right renal angle tenderness. And uh, vascular causes that we thought of were renal vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, trauma that we thought of was maybe any rib fracture, any, any fall that, uh, I mean, she didn't recall any trauma per se, but that can also explain the right renal angle tenderness. So investigations wise, she had an HP of 7.55 with a total count of 13,500, neutrophils of 78 percentage, lymphocytes of 12, monocytes of 8 and eosinophils of 2. Urea creat uh, was 25 and 0.53. Urinalysis was normal. So now we didn't consider a, a, consider a pyelonephritis at all in the picture. So ultrasound Doppler of the left lower limb was done. That showed uh, the left lower limb had varicose veins involving the great cephanus due to perforated incompetent competence. There was a dilated superficial vein, which was connecting the medial mid leg perforator. It was non-compressible, so they had thought of a likely acute thrombosis in the superficial veins of the left lower limb. So investigations, uh, what you see here is actually a wedge-shaped infarct. This is actually done further. We were suspecting a, a, a renal vein thrombosis high on our list. But the ultrasound Doppler did not show any evidence of a renal vein thrombosis. So we did went ahead with a CT abdomen actually. And in the CECT abdomen, we saw this wedge-shaped infarct, which was present in the right lung. So that's what we're seeing here as well and here as well. So uh, now we were thinking of something which was causing a prothrombotic state. And we were working up for why should she develop a prothrombotic state? So we did an APLA workup, which was negative. Homocystin, which was 7.2 uh, micromole per liter, which was normal. Uh, her TSH uh, was 0 0.003, T4 of 25.4, FTC of 3.96. TSH at receptor antibody was also positive. A work of a PNH was negative and an ultrasound thyroid was done because of the hyperthyroidism and that showed a diffusely enlarged thyroid. We did not do a prothrombotic workup in the setting of an acute thrombus. We are waiting on uh, after probably after six months when she comes and when we can stop the anticoagulation, we'll plan on doing that. So um, we didn't find any cause of the uh, cause of why she should have a unprovoked uh, pulmonary thromboembolism. So uh, our final diagnosis was of an acute pulmonary thromboembolism with a superficial vein thrombosis of the right lower limb, secondary to an untreated hyperthyroidism because during the time when she was admitted for the head trauma, that time they had done a TSH. It wasn't documented why they had done it. That time also the TSH was less than 0 0.003. And it was left untreated. So um, I'll be talking about how uh, a hypothyroid, like a few uh, cross-sectional studies on hypothyroidism and pulmonary embolism. So hypothyroidism is a hypercoagulable state. And one way in which it is a hypercoagulable th uh, hypercoagulable state is because of the fact that it is causes uh, atrial fibrillation, which predisposes you to have thrombosis. Other ways in which it can have uh, it can cause thrombosis is by uh, upregulated adhesion molecules in the vessel and endothelial marker proteins also increase, which will cause an endothelial dysfunction and thus through the Virchow stride, it will cause a thrombosis. It is also found to upregulate coagulation factors like factor 8, which uh, 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 makes it a hypercoagulable state as well. So... Um, so this uh, is one paper that was published in 2010, which looked at the risk of pulmonary embolism among patients with hyperthyroidism. So this was a retrospective case cohort study, and they had taken patients with hyperthyroidism between January 1, 2001 and December 31, 2003. And the outcome that they looked at was pulmonary embolism over a five-year follow-up period. So what they had found was the fact that uh, in comparison to um, those who did not have a pulmonary, uh, did not have a, a hyperthyroidism, the people with pulmonary embolism was 0 0.06 percentage, whereas in patients with hyperthyroidism, uh, the uh, uh, incidence of uh, the percentage of people who develop pulmonary embolism um, 
in a five year follow up period was actually 0.16 this had a crude um, uh, hazards ratio of 2.60 and adjusted uh, uh, hazard ratio of 2.31 with confidence interval lying uh, between 1.20 and 4.45 so in our patient uh, we had started her on clexane and warfarin and we had also started her finally on carbimazole and propranolol uh, so she's uh, coming for follow up next month then uh, we are yet to send a prothrombotic workup so our, my learning point from this case was that uh, when someone presents with a constant flank pain pulmonary thromboembolism should also be considered as a part of a differential and uh, never leave hyperthyroidism untreated as it is a hypercoagulable state can i ask a couple of questions where were the thrombi in the uh, leg veins where was the thrombus so it was in the one of the superficial uh, uh, superficial veins of the leg so she did not have in the popliteal or femoral no sir she didn't have so it is a distal superficial vein thrombosis in the left lower extremity yes sir and the pulmonary embolism where was the right descending pulmonary artery one of the segmental branches and was it truly flank pain or was she complaining of pleuritic pain on the right side so of the chest we asked her that and she was saying that it's a constant flank pain that was present why was the doppler done for the lower limb so sir there was some erythema and uh, pain along that area so the doctor has actually done in an outside center and, uh, and why did she have fever uh so sir fever can be present in patients with hyperthyroidism that was the reason but why that was fever was only for two days ah yes sir or other this thing is pulmonary embolism can also have a uh fever that is present when she came to the ward actually they were low grade fever spikes 100.4 100.6 she had a clinically insignificant except for the pain mm -hmm. she did not have tachypnea tachycardia hypoxemia nothing hemoptysis well i will call this a serendipitous diagnosis uh, questions or comments from the audience see uh, uh, the comment i have is that uh, making a diagnosis at the bedside that should be a primary aim see uh, we are now going into, we are seeing ai everywhere so um, if you do tests indis indiscriminately we will pick up abnormalities uh and the, do, does it really represent pathology which will adversely impact the patient's quality or quantity of life so and we are making labels giving patient diagnostic labels so be careful yeah she had pulmonary embolism i'm not saying that is serendipitous that, that is a incidental finding sorry it was truly uh, an abnormal finding and then the next comment i have is that calling hyperthyroidism a hypercoagulable state so let's so take a textbook like harrison's or up to date or an endocrinology textbook is a uh, uh, thromboembolism given as a manifestation of hyperthyroidism uh, so sir uh, at least other in terms of other hypercoagulable states cvt among the differences that are given in harrison one of it is hyperthyroidism actually and your review of literature all you found was one retrospective uh, case study which showed an study. association but there were multiple case reports of uh, hyperthyroidism induced pulmonary embolism just a question did your patient have af because af like you can throw embolism into the artery because embolism of the system also so if you cannot say like in the patient have af it can throw like, theoretically you can throw embolism into the pulmonary system also right? then you can't say hyperthyroidism directly the cause of the pulmonary embolism so she didn't have any af on all our ecgs and Oh, that uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? And then your anatomical localization. Just that's <laughs> like uh, where all did you localize the disease process to from? Uh, it's musculoskeletal to liver to kidney to. kidney lung swas muscle ribs liver okay thank you sir uh, next patient is 
from Medicine One, Dr. Lakshmi will be presenting, and the title is uh, Disseminated Meliodosis Presenting as Septic Arthritis. <laughs> 